Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. You're watching Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is Sean Gander. Uh, Sean, could you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm the author of Lost in Arcadia, a uh, satirical uh, comedic look at um, America today, even though the book is set in the near future, it's set about 20 years in the future. Um, I think Aria invited me here because I just had an essay out on LitHub writing about the kind of the state of satire right now, given where we are in American politics and uh, particularly the Trump administration. Yeah, so your piece is titled, Is It Still Possible to Satirize America? Uh, has very good art of Homer Simpson. And uh, I thought this piece was really interesting, and we'll we'll link to it below at Random Lit Hub. So could you kind of summarize the argument of the piece? Yeah. I, I mean, one of the one of the things I was going back to is something a uh, really fantastic satirical writer, um, Chris Batchelder, wrote years ago. And he, this is his first novel. Uh, he's a wonderful author. If you haven't read him, his most recent thing was a National Book Award finalist. And uh, he was writing about the way his first novel uh, became out of date about two years after he wrote it. It's right. about the satirical situation. Bear versus and, shark, which I, I read when it came out. Um, I don't remember why exactly, but it's it's a very funny uh, satirical novel. I, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, though. Oh no no I, I I it's not his best book but I, you know I, I, parts of what he wrote about and this is part of why it might not be his best book did go out of date as he noted um, the satirical parts the thing that were supposed to be over the top and that he is parodying um, you know as he he noted when the book was going out of print it almost felt like that made sense because uh, some of these issues had just become normal reality. Right. So, so, in, so in his, just to describe for people who haven't heard of it, um, in his novel, the kind of biggest entertainment event of the, of the year is a uh, battle between a computer-generated bear and a computer-generated shark. And, and this is like kind of like the Super Bowl. And everyone goes crazy for it, and there's all these. Everyone's always saying, you know, wh- which one would win, the bear or the shark? Is the how is the water or like? Is, I think it's the water's like knee level or something. And it goes into <laughs> all these crazy details, and it's kind of a broad, a broad satire of American society. And then a couple years after the, I think the book came out in 2002, mm-hmm. and then a couple in like 2004, um, Discovery Channel or Animal Planet or something aired an actual TV show that was almost the exact same premise of computer-generated animals fighting each other. Um, so. Yeah, and it did pretty well. I mean, it was <laughs> it, was, it, it was part of a, a fascinating thing watching as the Discovery Channel completely changed identities between, like, the early years versus the when that came out, and it was just like, how do you get ratings? Which is one of the things that you watch a lot of those stations go through. So I... I recently, so I had this book come out, and I was thinking back to this essay because one of the things that uh, my novel is dealing with uh, was particularly related to um, uh, this wall being built on the border. So when I first started writing the novel was in 2010, and uh, one of the reasons why I was writing about the wall was because the idea, you know, you you. It was mentioned within certain fringe groups, the the Minutemen, particularly on the Arizona border. But the idea was stupid. Just unadulterated, really, really bad idea. And, and you, you grew up in near the border in New Mexico. Yeah, I, I grew up in, the, in New Mexico. And immigration uh, is a thing that is always kind of... It's a big issue in the area in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and I, I assume uh, south of LA and California, but I don't really know that much. Uh, but it was kind of a thing you grew up with. And my dad is a criminal criminal defense attorney. He's a federal uh, defender, and so he was always defending people, uh, anything involving international relations, which is people going across the border. It's always a criminal. It's a, always a federal offense. Mm-hmm. So 
most of its clients were uh, involved with border hopping in one way or another. It's a federal thing. I knew people in my high school who got deported. This is a big thing I grew up with. But one of the questions that had always been asked was, how do you solve this problem? Is it really a problem? These are always ideas circulating. And then you always had the stupidest person in the room say, why don't we build a wall? And that it, and it always, as I said, the, the dumbest person there. I, I remember when I was in a high school government course, and uh, we were supposed to be debating something, and that was immediately one of the things brought up. It's like, well, why don't we build a wall? And um, uh, it's one of those ideas that you don't even want to debate because as soon as you bring it into the room, then you you know you kind of hit the uh, the climate change argument, and once you bring that into the room, there's something you're arguing about something that shouldn't be argued about. Mm -hmm. But I, when you're writing satire, one of the things that you're doing is you're bringing in. The, you're stretching it. You're bringing in the most ridiculous idea. That's how you're writing. And then you want to, uh, if you're the type of writer who I admire, I always think of like really good satirists. There's like today, there would be like George Saunders or people doing really wonderful stuff. Um, but you take that really stupid idea and you treat it deadpan and you treat it as if it's going on. So I was writing this novel and revising it for many years, doing different drafts. And then, uh, you know, during the period of time where I hit, like, final drafts, suddenly Trump was not only, you know, Trump won from being this weird fringe candidate on the outside of the Republicans to being, uh, you know, first he wins their primary, then he starts, you know, this becomes a mainstream thing. Once he won the primary and build that wall becomes this huge chant, that you have thousands of people um, saying, uh, one of the questions I found myself thinking about was, where does my book even sit in here? Like, the stupidest idea that I could have come up with was being chanted by thousands of people I in know. a room. Um, and, you know, there's no thought process. They, one of the things I didn't even think about uh, so in my novel, one of the questions that's, of course, asked is, how does this get funded? So I dealt with it. There's a one of the main characters, uh, like me, his, he's Hispanic, so there ends up being a, a large racial element of kind of him going against some of his heritage in this. But uh, he ends up with the idea of uh, make, turning it into a patriotic thing that corporations can sponsor and then have huge ads plastered around the wall. So uh -huh. when people are waiting at the border crossing, and let's say that this is a thing, people are waiting at the border crossing for 10 hours. So they're stuck there. So they're stuck looking at Coca-Cola for 10 hours that day as their, their ads are. So that was my idea of how to fund it. <laughs> the idea of they'll fund it, Mexico will do it for us, is beyond <laughs> the stupidest idea I can imagine. Like This pushed the boundaries of and that's a thing you always hear. Um, you always hear from writers in the last year. I, um, is that whenever they're writing anything, the difficulty is the Trump Trump administration is not believable. You know, you had um, you had Veep changing jokes about P because uh, they didn't want to be thought of as copying the. Uh, you know, at the last second they were changing that, uh, they didn't want to be thought of copying what was actually happening because they're just looking to be you know, an abstract thing. And I actually thought that that was a bad idea. And this is part of what I was writing about a little bit was one of the reasons why I think that satire is really powerful is, you know, oftentimes you're writing about this stretched reality, this thing that could happen, but what you are really writing about is what is happening. Mm -hmm. And I actually kind of came to a different feeling from Batchelder, which is that there's something more relevant when uh, you're writing about things actually happening. That's what people want to hear about. So um, one of the, if, if you're involved in the, uh, selling books. Everyone knows that over the last year, like almost two years, the two best-selling novels have been 1984 
and The Handmaid's Tale. Mm-hmm. Far and away, there's no comparison between the two of them and every other book, and it's because they are writing about certain things that are happening right now. People don't really want... Like, I, I don't know about you, but to me, this last season of Veep was the worst. It was a big disappointment, and part of it was... It felt like it was running away from running away from topicality in a way that, you know, felt kind of cowardly, felt like a way of copping out, of saying that we aren't up to the challenge of imagining what satire could be anymore. When, like, I, I feel like the onus is on writers now to think about how do you push that? You know, the reality can always get weirder. There's, uh, there's no real end uh, whenever a person's kind of like, Trump couldn't possibly do that, then two weeks later, inevitably, he has. The onus is on you to kind of be creative and be smart enough to think of what that might be. Where, where are you kind of as a, as a writer? I think, I think kind of Veep was disappointing to me because to me it's like, I understand the temptation to do that as a writer. It's also the laziest possible thing you can do is to say, I just can't do it. Like, what type of imagination is that showing uh -huh. on you when you just kind of opt out and go, Trump is too crazy, politics today are too crazy, we can't satire. It's like, yeah, of course you can. Like, they've, they've changed the norms that we can kind of push that with it. I can't, I can't really go into the point of view where, like, you can't move into writing about it in an intelligent way mm -hmm. but that's kind of my my point of view i mean the reason why i, I sort of kind of knew you way back in the day in college was because we both were writing humor mm -hmm. and uh i don't know where you stand in terms of that well i i wrote a, a non-humor piece that we'll link to below um that was about our age of absurdity. It's interesting that you bring up Orwell and Margaret Atwood's novel. I mean, those are classic dystopian novels. Um, and they kind of presume a hyper -conf competent government, <laughs> um, has, has been demonstrated over the past six months. We do not live in that kind of world. We live in a world run by morons. So that leads me more towards the veep, side of things you know it's funny that there's these two popular series about um life in uh, washington dc and government veep and house of cards mm -hmm. and in house of cards everyone's like a diabolical machiavellian character pulling the strings and in veep they're all morons they don't know what the hell they're doing and they're all just like venal idiots who um are like putting out fires all the time so it seems like which is more of our moment. It's definitely the satire and not the like prestige, um, tell, you know, cable drama. Well, one of the things that, um, particularly like it's difficult to discuss Trump in a certain light without discussing how he relates to, you know, he's, he doesn't exist ahistorically, right? He's, he's a product of a lot of systems and he, he's not exactly, but he's definitely related to fascism. But if you look at actually, this is actually, um, there's another podcast, if you've ever listened to Cracks, but it's a thing that they've discussed is the fact that if you look at some of the fascist dictators, like Hitler and Mussolini in particular, were really stupid, really, really bad also, but they managed to do certain things right. They kind of stumbled through the political process, kind of, I don't almost think of it as like Forrest Gump, uh -huh. just kind of somehow happen to say the right thing at the right time, go through, happen to do the right thing. If they'd done the, you know, uh, history get, got changed because some very deeply stupid people ended up having a series of things that happened. And if we look at Trump, in light of them, I feel like there there is a definite relationship. Kind of, everyone always will talk about Trump in terms of like, if X Y Z other person had done it, had done a tenth of these things, they never would have made office. Um, mm -hmm. That's like a common discussion every day. 
But the, yeah, there, there's a there's a great tweet. It's one of my favorite tweets of the past couple of years, which is um, something like, uh, "Well, let's see old Donnie Trump try to get out of this one." Uh, bracket. <laughs> he quickly gets out of it. Well, nevertheless, he yeah. does. He does have a kind of a preternatural ability to somehow um, slither his way out of things. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he has no shame, and um, you can't try to morally shame him into doing the right thing. He'll he doesn't give a shit. I th- I think that's. I mean, again, if we look at kind of a more historical approach to him, this was true for dictators in other countries in the past. Um, there's a certain shamelessness, but there's also, in order for a person to reach that point and to have cons- to have no consequences for their actions, other people have to enable them. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't just, they don't exist in a void, and for every insane thing that, d- that doesn't happen, you have ten instances of Paul Ryan saying, I just don't read his tweets. I don't know, he probably didn't mean that thing, you know? Yeah. And I think that the the greater absurdity in kind of the situation, I think it one of the things that this really points out is that our checks and balances that like you learn when you're in middle school, they're very drilled into you. Checks and balances uh, require a sort of baseline morality for people at different levels, and ultimately, if no one. Uh, if there isn't that baseline morality, if everyone is a sociopath, if everyone <laughs> in Congress is a sociopath and, and if the president and if the judges are, then no, there are no checks and balances. There are people making decisions. So, and I think that that's one of the things that's more interesting to me is, um, uh, you know, when you talk about Veep, I think maybe one of the difficulties that it has with doing satire of what's happening right now versus Obama is that Selena Meyer has public shame. She doesn't like to be, you know, there, she understands that what she's, and she also has a morality. She understands that what she's doing is pretty evil, but she just doesn't care. Um, with Trump, you never get the sense that there's even an understanding. It's, it's hard to, um, yeah, you know, so there's a character in my novel who's uh, he's a president. He's a far right wing president who builds this wall. Um, one of the my favorite things I learned was in the audiobook version, the guy who reads it actually does a Trump impersonation. I uh-huh. didn't tell him to do this. <laughs> he just decided to do it. Uh-huh. So my editor just emailed me and I was like, "You need to check this out." I was like, "That's amazing." <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I didn't do was right from his point of view and it's not really a point of view like you can describe the actions from the outside but it's hard to imagine an interiority there isn't much of a there there um there, another thing that you always see on twitter is people discussing is he senile what's his issue is right. he has some sort of dementia and Regardless of whether he is or not, what this kind of signals is a difficulty of figuring out. These are people trying to grasp with psychology, right? So you're looking, you're trying to psychologize him the way you would a normal human being. And so when people fail, they look for different excuses. You, I mentioned sociopathy, but you also have, you know, dementia. You have all of these are different ways of saying that you can't analyze that because. There isn't really a there there. There isn't an interiority, which is what we kind of look for. So, like, you <laughs> hear something from Obama, you look like you read one of the speeches, or, you know, he's a fantastic writer, which is, I think, uh, one of the weird things. You might not agree with everything he does policy wise, but there's an interiority. You can see there's struggle, there's sort of drama. There was that movie that came out, I think, last year about young. Um, Barack and Michelle having a romance and right. like uh, it was almost too easy because like you just kind of listen to one of his speeches and you get the psychology of this person right it, it, there's a character there's a human you can describe and there's nuance you can't do that with Trump he's a cartoon so you look at different cartoonish ways of dealing with them the way I dealt with that sort of thing was just to go no let's describe the actions and let's leave the psychology out because there's no point in giving a psychology where it doesn't exist. And 
the difficulty and the reality is everyone trying to figure out how to do that when there are real stakes. There aren't fake uh, science fiction, fantasy, uh, literary stakes. You know, actual lives are being affected by a person who doesn't seem to have, you know, you could say your, your way of putting it was he doesn't seem to have shame. Like, that's one way. But shame means that there's a person. How can there, <laughs> how can there be a human who doesn't have shame it's it's a really strange uh concept i i would be fascinated at an idea um who is it i think um uh so like don delillo um and his novels he uh you know writes from the point of view uh, he used to do this more he doesn't do it now but like in his late 80s early 90s stuff when he's writing from the point of view of various famous people so he is writing from the point of view of jfk or uh, J. Harvey Oswald was his biggest one. So he's writing from those point of views, and he could get into the psychology and everything. I can't imagine what a novel would look like from the point of view of Trump, because I don't think that there really is a point of view. Yeah, it's, yeah. He, he, I agree with you that he does seem to lack interiority, but at the same time, he, I mean, he is a human. He's not a automaton or a literal cartoon. <laughs> so something is going on in there. I do subscribe to the early onset or you know early stages of dementia theory. Just the the way he talks, jumping from one thing to the next, um, very associative. He can't seem to hold one kind of line of thought for any length of time. Reminds me of you know the way people with early stage dementia talk. Um, it's a lot like Grandpa Simpson. You always expect him to tell you how much he, like, that, you know, make America great is another way of saying, back in the day, I used to walk down there uphill both ways, and I, a uh, soda costs a nickel, <laughs> gosh darn it. And, you know, it's, it's another way of, um, but, I mean, it is a fundamental misunderstanding of uh, the past's relationship with the present, which is also a thing that people have with dementia. There's there's this cloud that's interfering with your understanding of how the two relate. And uh, I, I like, he's, I, he's I, childlike in the in the way that yeah, like an elderly person becomes childlike, and he, you know, he, he seemed to have a lot of fun when he got to be in the uh, cab of that, of that big rig, <laughs> and when he you know, got to wear that cowboy hat. It looked like he was having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I kind of, I think you're, when you mentioned childlike, it makes you think of looking at, uh, looking at old photos of yourself in like a fireman's <laughs> helmet when you're three and being like, yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun for me. He did that as a 70 year old president. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, I see that. Okay. Well, uh, let's, I, um, I I made a Twitter poll a couple weeks ago, and I said, "Who's you know who is the best um, like who whose dystopia do we live in?" And I, I think I, I put Orwell, Kafka, and the Marx Brothers. And I, I, would you agree that we're actually in the Marx Brothers kind of dystopia, I not like the Orwell dystopia? One of the things, yeah, I mean, it it is Freedonia. It has the um, well, for one thing, the word is perfect for it. Um, but yeah, I I think the whim, the part of the part of the Marx Brothers when when uh, when he's just every thirty seconds there's another weird whim because that's how Groucho is. Once mm-hmm. he's in charge, it's just like uh, okay, I you know it's it's been like twelve years since I last last saw the one where he's a dictator. But um, I that I think that part of it feels like Marx brother rather than um, Kafka kind of has the arbitrariness, mm-hmm. but I think Marx has the speed of the arbitrariness. Like Kafka's is slow and grinds you out. You know, it's very much uh, here's an arbitrary decision, and uh, it's just one decision, and that one thing is going to ruin your life. It makes me think of. Um, in Brazil, uh, Terry Gilliam's Brazil, not the country, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the name being changed from Buttle to Tuttle, or is it the other way? I can't remember. But the, the one letter bureaucratic change is what ruins the guy's life. And that's kind of Kafka. That's 
to use the dumb term, that's Kafkaesque. There's the one little thing, and then the system goes against you for that. Um, the Marx Brothers, Groucho, yeah, it's just rapid fire, bam, bam, bam. I think, ooh, I love that poll. I, I actually remember that. Um, I, what I love about that, though, is the speed of the news cycle. You know, because, uh, you know, Scaramucci was there for 10 days. Yeah. He's gone. And you you can't even, um, you, one of the things I... A shrieking I comes across the sky. That, that, was, <laughs> that was Scaramucci. Yeah. One, one of the things that I think, at least for me, and I think other people who, I remember in the first couple of months after the election... A lot of other writers I spoke with are very much like, I don't know how to get work done because there's just so much happening. And I think everyone in America would love like a month of respite. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, can you imagine an entire month where you didn't feel the need to protest something? There was no real stupid decision. You didn't worry that, you know, when... Uh, when Trump was uh, making that announcement, and there was like the minute between tweets, it was and nine. Like, it was nine things, minutes. All of, all of the military, <laughs> and you're just like, we better not be waging war against North Korea. Please, God, don't let that be happening. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had an entire month where that wasn't the case? And one of the things I thought about is I used to go, especially when I was really busy with writing, I used to go through like a, you know. I'll become engaged for half a year, and then I'll be really busy. I'll have personal things going on. I'll have a lot of work to get done. And I just would kind of tune out of the news. Maybe if there's something big, I pay attention, but like mostly tune out of the news for half a year. And you'd be like, well, things are pretty much happening the same. Like little things happen, whatever. I can catch up easily six months from now. It doesn't really matter. I can't. Get, like six days would be an insane amount of time for there to be no huge thing dropping. And that's the Marx Brothers. You know, that's their comedic pacing. You know, I feel like they're the people who you wouldn't have had airplane without the Marx Brothers because their approach is like, here's one minute and here's 30 jokes yeah. and five of the jokes are good. The other 25 <laughs> jokes are terrible. That's fine. So, uh, you know, I, th I think that that's part of the part of the thing that we miss is any sort of pacing with our lives in the news cycle. Um, so every decision, like, wouldn't it be amazing to hear a decision coming from the White House that was, like, competent? <laughs> like, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it amaze? And that, that's also Mark's brother, because it has to be a new thing. There has to be a new bit. But, like, imagine if the White House announced tomorrow that because they were unable to um, repeal Obamacare, that the same thing would be to uh, strengthen it and get rid of its issues, right? Imagine that as an announcement. We've decided that maybe the best thing for America is to uh, attempt at improving this thing because we tried the other way, and so now we're left with it, and we, the only thing left to do is to make it better, um, you can't imagine that in a million years. It's just truly the unthinkable has become uh, a sane decision. Well, you know, which is tr Trump, I, I read just a couple days ago that Trump is planning on taking two weeks of vacation at one of his golf clubs. So it's possible that we'll have some kind of late, no. late <laughs> August, you know, rest. There's, there's no way because during that <laughs> amount of time, there will be three leaks about secret things from Russia. Someone will get on his bad side. He'll go on Twitter because uh, he watched an SNL sketch and he'll <laughs> fire someone because of it. Like, I I will bet you anything that that two weeks is anything but quiet. Yeah. And uh, I, I think everyone in America, like, I would pay every cent I own to just have the rest of his three and a half years in office be one long golf trip. Like, <laughs> it just stays at the Mar-a-Lago and we don't hear a peep. Um, maybe nothing gets, no legislation gets passed because he doesn't sign off on anything. Who cares? That's all wonderful. Just kind of quiet Mar-a-Lago life for him. I'd pay everything. But and and the thing is, he would, he would enjoy that more too, which is kind of the weird thing. 
is that it's not like he is having a great time being president. He doesn't seem to like it very much. I'm sure he thought it would be different than it well, actually is. Well, I think one way you could think of the think of that and going back to comedy, you know, in Arrested Development, there's the um, uh, Will Arnett's relationship with his wife, where it's just an increasing series of bets where they eventually get married as a result. Right. That's basically how we ended up with him as a president. <laughs> like, he didn't seem to ever want it, and then we every time someone asked him, he had to say, "Oh yeah, I wanted it even more." And so years passed, and eventually he couldn't say he didn't want to because, I mean, one one of the things about our politics, and I, I feel like this is part of why he did win, is the idea of an admission, and this isn't just from Trump, an admission that you changed your mind based upon relevant information, like admitting that, oh yeah, I, I said that thing before, but I didn't know all the facts, and now that I know all the facts, that was a terrible idea. Yeah, that would be an insane thing to hear from Trump, but I think that it's it's the over-the-top part of our entire political system where that would be kind of... Um, that would be political suicide for any member of Congress. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if Paul Ryan admitted next week that, um, oh yeah, he read up about X Y Z issue uh, about healthcare and he realized that that was a bad idea and he should have done it, you would have been like, who abducted you and replaced you with an alien? That's not how politics work. And I think one of the reasons why I didn't. I, I, I didn't feel weird about my novels like satire being so close to reality with the, the president being essentially Trump and such. Uh, they also pass a Muslim ban in my novel. So there's all these random things that you wouldn't think would happen. Uh, is that I do feel like these were, they were satirical, but they were kind of the direction everything was headed. Mm-hmm. Like you kind of, it's not like, and I keep saying this, it's not like he exists a historically, but there is a, you know, the Republicans were already headed in that direction. His incompetence is kind of mesmerizing and takes up the news cycle. But uh, aside from winning against Hillary, which I doubt any other Republican probably could have done, once they were in office, how is, aside from the incompetence, how is how are his policies any different from anyone else? Anyone else who is Republican would have gone against uh, health care. Anyone else would have been jingoistic. We have a really terrible... Jeff Sessions is fascinating because he's just a terrible, terrible man with terrible policies. He's kind of um, keeping this investigation into Trump happening by his very existence and protecting Mueller, but like... Jeff Sessions as president would be much, much worse. He would be, um, you know, the homophobia that he, that he brings in, the, the, his reinstatement of the full-on war on drugs. There's, there are a lot of, like, these are mainstream Republican ideas, and mm-hmm. they seem very, very catastrophic, but they're not like... It's not like most of what Trump has voiced, aside, you know, like the wall is over the top, but the jingoism the xenophobia, all of these things that it kind of represents metaphorically, because it was always more of a metaphor than anything else. Um, they're not very different from just a mainstream Republican point of view anymore. I don't know. Well, what's what I haven't figured out, what's still a mystery to me, I mean, I, I kind of firmly believe that Trump doesn't care about policy at all and has no real ideology. He just kind of has some vague ideas and some instincts and he really seems to hate Obama and so he wants to if Obama did X he, he does wants seem to, do, to really hate Obama yeah he wants to do the opposite of X um, what I what I haven't figured out is why Trump is not trying to just govern down the middle because he isn't you know he doesn't owe anything to the Republican Party they didn't want him you know he won in spite of them not because of them and they, they tried their best to keep him out so he could governed down the middle um, by being a populist, um, you know, anti-immigrant, anti-free trade, but, um, we'll pro- I mean, this is what he said during the campaign, we'll protect your Social Security and Medicare, 
know, mm-hmm. that, that seems like a pretty popular position in the, it's not you know, popular among the elite, but among regular voters, that is, I, I would guess that's where a lot of people end up. But I think he honestly just is too stupid to realize that that would be a um, successful political strategy. And Paul Ryan convinced him that they needed to repeal Obamacare or to cut taxes. Um, so he just went along with that because he, he doesn't know any better. I think one of the things is that doing, making those decisions, like, that's hard. Um, <laughs> even, even if it seems not that difficult, you're like, these are just popular things people want. I think it's really easy for him to just kind of listen to what's loudest and say, we'll do that. And what's loudest isn't necessarily the same thing as what's most popular. In fact, it's often not. But uh, I think one of the things he seems to be most interested in is governing governing by way of least resistance. You know, uh, the number of appointees he's given is incredibly small. Everyone discusses this. He's kind of dismantled the federal government through apathy, yeah. through just not, not you know, appointing people to really basic positions. So it's just a skeleton crew who's been running the government. And I don't think, you know, there's conspiracy theorists that are like, oh, yeah, this is part of, like, he's part of deep state plans to get rid, get rid of all this, and it's nefarious and everything. I just think that's hard. That requires signing a lot of papers. I think each person he's got to be like, what's their position on this? What's their position on this? Yeah, he doesn't um, care. Yeah, and it's much easier to just go, you know, I'm against that because that gives me more time to golf. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't, I, I'm, I think the, one of the, you know, the Russia scandals, that's going to, that's going to continue through all four years. There's no way that that's going away. That's always going to be part of this administration. Um, well, do, but, you, do you think that he is too stupid to be involved in an international conspiracy? Well, I, my opinion is that he's too stupid to have realized it was a conspiracy. Uh-huh. He just did what they said because it was easy. Like, uh-huh. his business deals are never smart. His business deals are things about making things easier for both sides. But he's not like a person... So, uh, in contrast to him, you would have Warren Buffett, right? So, Warren Buffett's a genius investor whose stratagem tends to be doing really hard, nitty-gritty work, finding, finding companies that are in niches where they could really improve based upon small changes, um, and o- investing wisely in them. It's a really labor-intensive way of making a profit. Um, Trump's business has never been about that. It's about how do I make a really easy deal with this government, whether it's Russia or it's a lo- you know a state government. How do I get some sort of tax subsidy? And you know, I mean, he does have, I mean, in his defense, I suppose he does have a genius for branding and um, <laughs> and self-marketing. Well, if he, if he was born with the name um, Donald Schlotsky, do you, think, <laughs> uh, do you think we would have him as president? I think that kind of like with uh, Hitler is one of those random things that happened to go right for him that he just got so lucky about and kind of continued. But, or, you know, Gandard. If he was Donald Gandard, I can't imagine that we would have a... Uh, we He would have had nearly that that sort of success. I think realizing that Trump sounds good, uh, and this isn't, this isn't like rocket science. How (laughs) difficult was it to be like, oh, my name is automatically like a powerful sort of thing. Everyone's heard of this before. Um, What are some of his other geniuses of branding? He likes to uh, change all the fixtures in his uh, hotels to be gold colored. No one's ever thought that gold meant opulence before, right? That was brilliant. This is like totally <laughs> thinking outside of the box right here. Well, I think he is a, a, a talented con artist, and that takes a certain type of intelligence. It's not the type of intelligence we, we want to be um, 
in charge of the nuclear arsenal, but it's <laughs> it worked out crazily enough. It worked out well for him. I want to ask you about comedy more generally in, in the age of Trump. Um, I had a guest on last year. Um, I think his name is Oliver Knox, and he wrote a piece for oh. The Atlantic called um, yeah. uh, The Search for the Conservative John Stewart. And it was kind of, and we talked about kind of comedy in the uh, comedy in the Obama era back then. And one of the things I thought was like Obama was never. I mean, even I think people who didn't like him would agree he was never like a figure of fun in the way that George W. Bush and Bill Clinton were figures of fun. Um, and then, but then Trump is like beyond the figure of fun to where he is like the like total cartoon character. Like, I mean, who, who, like, what comedy, what political comedy do you like right now? What, who do you think is, like, doing a good job? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, and it's almost hard to answer because political comedy is, as much as everyone says it's difficult to do, it's kind of ubiquitous, right? I feel like there's almost a weird revival in the New Yorker used to have notoriously bad comedy, at least in my opinion, it was always just like uh, over the course of a year, there'd be like two solid <laughs> pieces where you're like, those are good. Um, but it, it was notoriously bad. I feel like over the last like three months, I, I keep on reading things there where I'm like, oh, that was incisive. That was uh, that had me laughing out loud. Um, it, it is. He's an easy target. You know, as you said, he's like all he's almost cartoonish. He's this figure of fun. Um so I, I have trouble um, nailing one thing. And then w one of the things is, like, you want to see people do comedy. He's so much a cartoon character that you're looking for the new takes on that character. Mm -hmm. So it's like you don't want just kind of like your basic um, Baldwin uh, uh, SNL take because it's just – it's just so basic. There, right. there, there isn't any anything really exciting about that in a way that you kind of want other things to be. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah, we're making fun of the, fun of him and such. And I think that's one of the reasons why the best of the SNL stuff um, from last season was uh, all of the peripheral people. You know, obviously he was famous for that. Alec Baldwin, yes, yes, very much. But everyone went crazy over Melissa McCarthy's Spicer because. There was something new to observe. Mm -hmm. um, I my favorite thing with, that they did was still Steve Bannon as the Grim Reaper. That to me was the best, the best joke they did. Period, and it was unlike everything else. It wasn't like it was actually understated, which SNL doesn't do. Mm -hmm. They didn't really comment on it very much. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah, he's just deaf. That's fine. <laughs> um, but with Trump, like, what do you? Um, he is a cartoon character, so the best comedy really is about the rest of it. You know, I think that it's easier to make fun of what McConnell's doing and how it relates to Trump than it is to actually make people laugh at Trump anymore. You mostly you just kind of sigh because it's like um, it's almost like uh, post season like eight Homer Simpson, <laughs> where they like made him so stupid that there it isn't funny anymore so uh -huh. they're just Nick you're like oh yeah yeah he did that but that, that's not where the laughter is you're hoping but there are still good jokes to be had in the sun sense for the next few years um but they're not around Homer he's just kind of the center that's over the top so I think that the the rest of it and I think seeing the system function so poorly you know like one of the things that we also grow, we grow up indoctrinated with as Americans is we're the best country in the world. And, you know, our government's the best, our democracy's the best. We invented democracy somehow, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, we, we get, get a lot of those sort of arguments. And I think that one of the things that Trump makes people, particularly really patriotic liberals, which is... You know, they're really patriotic liberals and really patriotic conservative. It doesn't, you can be the flag waver for either side. I think one of the things that it makes people confront is how bad the whole system is in a lot of these ways. A lot, 
if the system's goal is to pre prevent a dementia-ridden child from being the president and letting his every whim be the what happens to the country, maybe the system's not working quite so well. Yeah, and, and this, this is kind of the point I made in my piece um, about Trump and absurdity, is that it calls into question, you know, the, uh, the mythology that we've built up around our country mm -hmm. as being, um, you know, this exceptional thing and um and yeah the constitution was was uh, shaped so that someone like trump couldn't assume power but it happened anyway so maybe the constitution is not as great as you know we're taught in elementary school i think uh i think one of the things uh if i remember correctly you said something like uh the president shouldn't be taken so seriously right now but either should the united states mm -hmm. and i think um, really, I feel like the biggest crisis is just a kind of a systemic thing. And Trump is hard not to focus on. He's always the thing that you, he, he draws all the light in the room wherever he is. He's going to be the loudest. He's going to say the craziest thing. You always have a sound bite. Somehow, whatever he does, you always, I do... I am endlessly fascinated by people's ability to find a Twitter quote the opposite of anything. He it's incredible, does. yeah, it's incredible. That, that, that thing is just mesmerizing <laughs> to me. Like, I, I can't look away from that ever. But um, Yeah, the best joke about that that I saw was um, someone saying, like, you know, someday he's going to, like, like get his head stuck in like a beehive and then they're going to plot it all quote. So like, only a loser would ever get his head stuck in a beehive. Like, I certainly never will. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, you know, when you've seen people be like, be like, is this somehow, um, Twitter from time travel? Like, how is it, how is he so spot on again and again and again? Um, but all of that, I think, takes, takes a lot of attention away from how much of a mess everything else has to be to get us to there. As you said, like, there should be checks and balances, and there should be a lot of, uh, again, I, I feel like you, the expectation is that always that there should be a certain morality. And um, I tend to be more, um, I get a lot angrier at people who do have that there, who have the interiority and I can see that they have it and them committing evil than I do against the like, uh, don't get me wrong, very harmful, very hurtful, ruining many lives, uh, demonic president, but, it, but if he is a sociopath or is has dementia, whatever it is, he doesn't seem to be capable of having a human morality that we think of. <laughs> but many of these people do, and you can see it, and you can watch them in action doing nothing to truly prevent this, doing nothing, and you can see them being noticing the lives that are that are being changed i went to a um a political rally when my local i, I live in florida right now uh, teaching at a one of the colleges here and uh going to the rally there and um there was one question at the end of it you know it's like an open forum um he was very blindsided by the room being overflowing with people instead of normally like eight constituents who are his friends showing up instead mm -hmm. it was like uh 300 uh, only eight of whom were his friends <laughs> and so uh but he was very very smart but there was a question at the end that completely caught him off guard and it kind of uh it was about um you know, again, I'm, I'm in Florida, and it was a question about the way Trump's actions uh, with Mar-a-Lago and everything have affected just his basic constituents. The Florida House of Representatives, you're in, you're in Congress, you should, um, you should be protecting your constituents against the way he's wrecking the economy uh, of Florida right there, right? And so he was completely blindsided by this. He couldn't compute. He, it just... It was almost watching a computer. It's like he had all these canned answers for everything else. And then suddenly, uh, when people were talking about this stuff, it, you could see that it was going on in his head. Oh, this is hurting people I care about. And suddenly, he 
stopped the conference altogether and he just left. Hmm. And it, it was kind of incredible watching him. Be, be, before that, it was like a used car salesman and, you know, whatever answer. You can't tell whether there's a person or not. It's just he's got his patter and whatever. But then there's a moment where it's like, oh, he does care whether people get hurt. And he notices that this is happening and he's still supporting. He's a Tea Party member uh, and he's still going fully on this way. And that's much more angering to me is whenever there's kind of... Um, that that part of things, I get very very angry at particular like the effects of Trump and everything else as everyone does. But I think the enablers are a much bigger problem, especially because they're not going away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, four years from now. Well, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> Uh, maybe the last question I want to ask you is, um, in your piece, you note that you wrote your senior thesis in college about Infinite Jest mm -hmm. and um, David Foster Wallace's novel, which coincidentally I'm using to prop up my uh, computer right now, so the uh, camera nice. is, is higher up. Um, nice. And I saw a joke on Twitter yesterday from um, Matt Chrisman of uh, Chapo Trap House where he said, um, you know, the the entertainment is just the news right now. Like you can't peel your eyes away from the news. Cause there's always something happening. Do you, do you think we're living maybe in David Foster Wallace's dystopia of non of, you know, nonstop entertainment, le you know, leading to, um, societal well, decay. I think one of my, and I, I actually wrote an essay about this not that long ago. One of the things about that is that David Foster Wallace's dystopia is very uninterested in what happens to, uh, he just doesn't write about it, it, what happens to people of color. And those are the people most predominantly affected by Trump. So we have, it, you're just lashing out at whatever he is. It's almost like he was playing D&D uh, &D and he rolls a die and that's like the minority that he lashes out against that week. Uh -huh. So it's like, oh, last week he rolled a one. It was transgender people. <laughs> All right, the week before it was Muslim. You know, it's kind of that sort of thing. And I think that that part of it would have been difficult for David Foster Wallace to wrap his head around. He's certainly an empathetic person, but he's from a very white part of the Midwest. And it's just not from, it's not a thing he would have thought about with politics, to, mm -hmm. be, to be totally honest. But... The entertainment, I think, if you look at his president, Johnny Gentle, he was an entertainer, and there's a reason why. He's a, he's a 50s, like, crooner. He's actually a real person, which is the weird thing. Oh, really? A lot of people, um, there's, a, there's a lot of really bad academic essays about that book, and a lot some of them misidentify him as a fictional person, but he's actually a real crooner, and... A lot of things in that book that I you hear are fictional or or not. Uh -huh. uh, so that's that's very intentional, and there's something akin to kind of Trump's reality star ness that's taking it up. But Gentle is a populist. You know, he's um, what you mentioned earlier about going for why doesn't he just go for whatever people want to do and just kind of consolidate power by going for. Uh, going for the mass, that's kind of what Johnny Gentle did. And it's harmful in very different ways. He's con unconcerned with Mexico and Canada. He does, does a bunch of different things. But he just... Uh, he He's not really... And there, there is even a Steve Bannon character, now that you mention it. There's a... Um, there's, a there's actually a voice behind... Um, no, I, I feel like Bannon's influence isn't as much as anyone feared it would be from the, the beginning of Trump's time. But there's kind of this voice behind uh, Johnny Gentle and Inf Infinite Jest if you reread it. And uh, I think that that's kind of interesting. But I just feel like Gentle wants to... He wants to be in power and he's not really as whimsical. Um, <laughs> he doesn't have the Marx Brothers aspect I, I still think I think that that observation is really spot on 
I, and he doesn't ha- he doesn't have that part of it. You know, the Marx Brothers version, it's all in one room mostly. Mm-hmm. So like you can see the, see all of his whims playing out immediately. You just think of that room as a whole country, and that's kind of what we're what we've had. <laughs> but J- Johnny Gentle has been in office for a long time. He's been staying in power. There's been like a lot of gradual long term changes, sort of thing. Um, he doesn't seem to just kind of randomly hire and fire people. He's had the same people for the whole time. There's like a solid cast. There's a there's a lot more of a just kind of wanting. I, I would say he's closer to Putin. Uh-huh. You know, what he wants is just to have power and to reshape things and to make the country into his own image. You could think of um, Johnny Gentle's big thing is what's called experimentalism in the novel which is just taking over nearby countries by just kind of signing agreements with the government, which is what Putin literally did with Ukraine. Mm-hmm. He just experialized Russia to Ukraine, and that's what happened in, in, in the West. Uh, very stable. A lot of people get killed killed for talking out against it. There's just evil assassinations and that sort of thing. That's part of the world of Infinite Jest. But I feel like Putin's world is more what he describes, and I, I, I do feel like Trump is just the Marx brother. You know, Putin has um, Putin has state control of television. That's another thing that you'd want to you'd see sort of infinite just way of getting out media that way. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe we're living in the world of infinite just in a certain way, but it's on the other side of the country. <laughs> I don't know. Um. We've gone about an hour, um, so why don't we leave it there? Um, the novel is Lost in Arcadia, uh, on sale now. We'll include it's a, real dark, but yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll include a link um, to the Amazon page. And um, So, Sean, uh, thanks so much for coming on Culturally Determined. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast or any blogging podcast in iTunes and you can leave a rating and that helps more people find the show um, who maybe would be interested in it. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Sean, thanks for coming on and we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much, Arya.